Our surround stage speaker is about to begin. Please take your seats. Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Nancy Pollock Elwand. I'm the Dean of the College of Architecture, Planning and Landscape Architecture at the University of Arizona. And it is my great pleasure to be introducing Courtney Crossan, architect, researcher, and teacher, and also the director of the Drockman Institute. Now, I should explain what the Drockman Institute is for those who don't come from the University of Arizona and Tucson area. The Drockman actually is a community-based scholarship research institute from the university, uh, within the university, that sits within our college. And it deals with the pressing issues that communities are dealing with in the built environment. So we live in the Sonoran Desert, so our key and most critical pressing issue is water. We know a lot about water and the lack of water in the, the desert. And the best demonstration of that is that if you come to Tucson or if you've been, uh, and if you've had this experience, you look at a map and it has the Santa Cruz River on it, this blue line, you go over to the river and you look down and there's no water there. About 98% of the time there's no water in the Santa Cruz River. And it is really um, disturbing for, on many levels, but it's also disturbing to know the history of Tucson and the settlement that goes back thousands of years. And it's based on the innovative and judicious use of water by Native tribes, Native American tribes in our, our area. So you can say, well, this was a series of bad decisions, political wrangling, overdevelopment, but it all comes down to, at the end, climate change. So in the face of this climate change, this impossible future, when we look, look forward, this no water in the river situation, we turn to innovators like Courtney Crossan, who's not only thinking, theorizing, and doing the predictions and doing the analysis, but she's also providing concrete action, which you're going to see presented here today. So I give you Courtney Crossan and her presentation on net zero urban water futures. Courtney. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, and thank you for that introduction, Nancy. She gives the best introductions. So like, like Nancy said, I am an architect. And architects have imagined, for the last century, our desert cities as oases, full of sunshine, burgeoning economies, and construction over seemingly endless desertscape. But that reality, this mirage, has been enabled by imported water. And so the slide before, you saw my home, Tucson, Arizona, and the Sonoran Desert. And what you see behind me is the Central Arizona Project that brings in water over 300 miles to Tucson from the Colorado River. And currently, 400 million people rely on the Colorado River for their daily water supply. So at this point, I want to pause and point out that there are two Colorado Rivers for my Austin audience, right? So you guys have a Colorado River in Austin that runs through Texas. And then I'm talking about a different Colorado River here. And um, I have to think, funny story, yesterday I was in my lift uh, coming here and my wonderful lift driver, John, he heard I was presenting and he turned off the music and was like, okay, go, present. <laughs> And so I was doing my spiel from the back seat, and he said, wait a second, we have our own Colorado River. So he pointed this out to me that, that I needed to share with you all. Um, yeah, so unlike um, other things, the one in Texas is smaller. The Texas Colorado is smaller than, than this, this large one that I'm talking about that goes from Colorado through the Grand Canyon uh, and um, out through or it used to, um, through the Sea of Cortez, um, through the Gulf of California. Right, so 40 million people rely on the Colorado River for their daily water supply. But currently, we are in the largest mega drought in over a millennium. 
And uh, at the end of last year, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation stated that in order to keep Colorado River water at a sustainable supply, we needed to cut demand on that supply by over 40%, which is a lot. That is a lot of water. That is a, that is a big paradigm shift. And a big challenge to the cities that depend on that river. And I'm talking about cities like Tucson, Phoenix, Los Angeles, San Diego, Salt Lake City, uh, Las Vegas, Albuquerque, Denver. So there's a lot of people, seven different states involved in this um, and involved in depending on this water supply. So how are we going to shift our urban water systems um, to a new paradigm? It's a big question and a big question for people like me who are architects and work in the built environment. So we're faced with this question, are water self-sufficient cities possible in the U.S. Southwest? And I'm here to tell you they are. I believe the answer is yes, <laughs> it is possible. Um, and before going into the four paradigm shifts that I think are necessary in order to move to uh, net zero urban water cities, I want to tell you a little bit about how I came to this work my water research, um, and how I came to believe in net zero water. So what you see behind me is a secondary school in Mahuru Bay, Kenya. It is net zero water. Uh, it's on the lake, um, banks of Lake Victoria uh, that you can see Lake Victoria there in the sunset. And it was my first project as an architect. Um, there I am at 25. Uh, I was a project manager and designer of this school. And the interesting thing about this project um, was that it had no infrastructure tied to it, right? So when I got the seven acres of land and started envisioning this school, there wasn't a uh, piped water supply coming in. There wasn't a sewer system taking uh, wastewater out. There wasn't uh, you know, electrical lines bringing energy in. And so the real challenge was how to work with the natural environment in order to get the resources necessary to run the school. So I began my architectural career really thinking about these different systems uh, and resources and how we work with the natural environment to be self-sustaining. So another project in my later 30s uh, that I worked on, also net zero water, uh, that I did the, the system design for, is Santa Monica City Services Building. And our client for this project was the city of Santa Monica. And uh, it is a net zero energy and net zero water building. Uh, but interesting, it had all that infrastructure and had all those um, different constraints. And we had to work with a lot of permitting <laughs> to, get it, to get it through. The cool thing about this building is it's the extension of the city hall in Santa Monica. And it is now the building that people go to to get other buildings permitted in Santa Monica. And so um, other architects come in. They need to use the composting toilets there. They drink the rainwater uh, that's supplied by this building. So through my project uh, experience as an architect, I've come to believe in these systems are, are possible. And uh, currently, I'm leading a four-year project funded by the National Science Foundation to look at net zero urban water cities throughout the Southwest, how we transition our cities uh, to uh, embrace self-sustaining water supplies. And so this project is with a few other universities. It's with University of California, uh, Los Angeles, Colorado School of Mines, Colorado State University, University of New Mexico, and then of course, the University of Arizona where the project's housed, um, and with myself leading it. And we're looking at Albuquerque, Denver, Los Angeles, and Tucson. And you'll see that these are cities of varying size and with their own political constraints and, and different dynamics going on um, to look at how they transition uh, to be self-sustaining. And we're working with uh, different water agencies, the utilities in these cities as well. So academia and utilities working together across uh, four years uh, to, to, to really start to crack this, this problem. So there's four paradigm shifts necessary. The first one, average and extremes. First paradigm shift. 
And I'll, I'll talk about this by first talking about the Sonoran Desert. So uh, this is our beautiful monsoon season, yeah? Oh, people who have experienced the monsoon, right? Sometimes there's the thought that you live in hot areas and there's no seasonal difference, um, but we do have seasons, and one of my favorite seasons is monsoon season. So you can see it's, it's dramatic, right? You can see the monsoon clouds approaching um, from a distance, and it really is this full um, experience of water. And this is why we have saguaro cacti, for example, in the Sonoran Desert. Um, because they're able to take in a large amount of water, right? That accordion, and they fill up their fat and happy cacti after, uh, after, the, after a good monsoon rain. Um, but what we're experiencing right now, uh, people who've lived in Tucson a long time know that our monsoon season is changing, right? It's both shifting, um, so sometimes getting you know, shorter or shifting a little bit occurring later, um, and there's also greater extremes. Um, so we're getting uh, longer um, periods of dryness. Some seasons we're not getting as much of a monsoon rain. In some seasons we're getting a lot of monsoon rain. So under climate change, we're experiencing those, those, um, those differences. Another example you see behind me, this is California. This is Sacramento uh, in January this year. And uh, yeah, this is after an atmospheric river. I hear they're getting one tomorrow as well. So let's pray for our people in California. Um, but this is what happens. They're in a mega drought, technically, but can also experience this large scale flooding, right? And you can see how significant it is, right? Um, and so more effects of climate change, right? And so I bring this up is because as a designer, as an architect, we're used to designing things to like fixed conditions. We have design parameters, right? So a lot of times with our, with our climate, with our weather, we think about that in average conditions. We're gonna design something to perform in kind of an average condition. But like I've shown you, we're also experiencing greater extremes and a, and a lot of changes. So we need to change the way that we, we do design. So, I wanna talk about adaptive capacity because this is really the new goal. Rather than these fixed design parameters, it's a performance-based kind of design uh, to be able to do adaptive capacity. So first, let me tell you about these maps behind me, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about that diagram. So these are from a study published in Science in 2017. There's a few different studies similarly published uh, like this. Uh, but let me guide you through a few of the maps. I'll start with the top one. Uh, this is basically projected changes in the next several decades underneath climate change, projected climate change. And the point here is that a lot of times when we talk about climate change, we think that there's kind of a universal consequence that we're all going to experience, that the shift is going to be similar. Um, but these maps show us that that it's actually pretty diverse. And sometimes there's good outcomes and sometimes there's negative outcomes. And so up here you see agricultural yields, for example. So in some places, agricultural yields are gonna go down. In some places, it's, it's actually gonna go up. Um, and other ones you see here are mortality, energy expenditures. Again, you see this kind of up and down, these up and down changes. Uh, low risk labor, high risk labor, coastal damages. Um, and interestingly here you see property, uh, crime and violent crime, which has actually been correlated to changes in the climate as well. Um, and so the point here again is that as designers, we need to be um, doing what you see over here. So in the past, we've really thought ourselves um, more as engineers, right? Doing this thing called engineering resilience, um, which we have a state of equilibrium. And we know that the system, you know, is going to go up and down a little bit side to side, but we, the idea is that it returns back to equilibrium at the same point. But we need to now be designing with nature. And so our real goal, our new goal, is ecological resilience, which means, like I described in, in the Sonoran Desert and in California, the parameter is changing over time, right? So instead of resilience being um, coming back to the same place, that the, the performance criteria is changing over time. So that's the big paradigm shift. And so I want to show you this, how, bring it back to water systems, right? So when I talk about water systems, 
I like to think about the natural system, social systems, and the built environment. And the natural system is what I call um, the ceiling. It's really the supply, the water supply, how we're getting our water. And then next, we have our social system, which is the foundation, the demand, how much people need water. And then thirdly, we have the built environment. And really, the built environment is mediating between these changes in the natural system and social systems, right? That's the adaptive capacity um, that the built environment, between these kinds of changes, like you see flooding, earthquakes, um, climate, in the natural system, and then in the social system, things like population growth, economic growth, um, public perception, regulation, and code changes. And so my role, our role, <laughs> as architects, is really to be able to design such that, uh, design water systems such that it has that adaptive capacity to meet those changes. Okay, so paradigm shift number two, centralized and decentralized. So what you see behind me is our typical experience with our water system, right? It's our centralized system. We go to turn on a faucet, we expect to get water out, wash our hands, take a drink of water, turn it off, and we don't think much more about it, right? We don't think about all the pipes underground, we don't think about that Central Arizona project, 300 miles, bringing the water in to our tap. Um, you know, we don't think about this whole infrastructure in the U.S. Southwest that's bringing us water and all the embodied energy in that water. And this is, this is a centralized system, um, meaning uh, in our uh, this is the model of our cities, there's a wastewater treatment facility, usually on the outside of the city, treats the water, and then it fills all of our pipes throughout the city. Then we, the water goes down the drain, um, and it goes back out uh, to the wastewater treatment plant, again, usually on the outside of the city. And we don't really think much more of it. Um, but we are in a reality where water is much more precious. And we don't need everything treated to drinking water quality, right, that we use. We need drinking water treated to drinking water quality, but water for toilet flushing, for example, water for irrigation, doesn't need to be that same centralized system treated water. And so we're, becoming, we're coming to realize that there's many different kinds of water. There's, you know, sources, alternative water sources, rainwater, storm water, reclaimed water, gray water. These are different, um, different opportunities um, within our water system to not use that drinking water, but replace it with alternative water sources. This is really important. So we're not getting rid of that centralized system. That's really important for public health. It's important that we maintain our water quality level um, through a centralized authority. Um, but we're introducing other decentralized ways of bringing in water, rainwater, stormwater, gray water, um, into our system. So we're doing both. So I want to tell you a little bit about a project that gives you an example, um, idea of how we integrate uh, these alternative water sources into our centralized system. So this is one of our favorite facts in Tucson, the fact that more water falls on Tucson by volume in rainfall than we actually use in water um, annually. And so that's 144%. So our annual rainfall equals 144% of our, of our annual um, water demand in Tucson. Which, interestingly, back to that Colorado River, um, is over four times uh, the amount of imported water we have. So that's a lot of rainwater. So we talk in Tucson, how <laughs> you know, can we uh, put this rainwater uh, to better use within our city um, to really answer these drought questions and these water uh, constraints? So there's a lot of complications, actually. It sounds simple on the surface. Oh, all this rainwater, why can't we use it? So I'm going to guide you through the, the complexities of um, how to integrate rainwater into our current centralized system and uh, basically a research project that is a, basically a thought pro project uh, to see what is the true capacity of that rainwater to fit our needs. So to start the story, I have two maps of Tucson up here. One is uh, displaying some 
calculations annually, and then one is displaying calculations for the month of June. So this map is, you'll see these squares. They're one mile by one mile squares across the city, uh, roughly matching our, our transportation grid. And the green that you see is where we have taken the amount of rainfall, in this case annually, that falls on that one mile by one mile square, and we have subtracted it by the amount of demand in that same section. So when it's green, it means that there's more rainwater than there is demand. And then the red is the opposite. There's more demand than rainwater. So you can see, despite that 144%, there's some red areas, which is where there's greater water demand, right, than rainfall. So that's one thing. You know, demand is not um, evenly distributed across the city. There's places of greater density of people. There's places of more, uh, more landscape demand, for example. And then in June, you see another issue over here. June, it's bright red, right? This is our hottest month in Tucson. It's the month right before our monsoon season. And, um, and so you see that it really doesn't, the rainfall is not, is not gonna satisfy demand in that month. And let me show you a few other <laughs> constraints to this issue. Infrastructure limitations. So when I talk about rainwater systems to my students, I talk about it in terms of three factors, catchment, conveyance, and storage. And so up here on the top, you see, um, you know, big scale thinking, catchment, conveyance, and storage. Uh, you have the watershed, you have a river, and you have storage in a lake or reservoir. You can also think this in a smaller scale in terms of like a saguaro cacti. You have the root system net that is the catchment. You have the veins of the cacti that um, are the conveyance. And then you have the storage, that accordion tissue, you know, that swells and shrinks with the amount of water that it has. So in the built environment, you have a roof, you have a pipe, you have a cistern. And so this roof, um, this is catchment, and it's a limiting factor, right? So um, all that rain that falls across the city, we can't capture all of that. We can only capture the amount that's falling on the roof. And then the other limiting factor is the storage, right? How big our storage systems are to get us through those long periods of dryness, that big, you know, red, hot June month. Um, so the storage is really important. And so the research project I want to show you is uh, basically solving for how big the storage needs to be per household in Tucson in order for rainwater to satisfy our imported water supply. So what would it take for rainwater to get us off the Colorado River, to get us off imported water? And so the solution that we found was 10,000 gallons of storage per household in Tucson, which is about the size of a swimming pool. So it's interesting. So I say this to say that it is possible to integrate these alternative water sources in different ways. And here's the results. Um, again, the 10,000 gallons is an average outcome. Um, but interesting here are the dots. This is, uh, these are our current rainwater adopters throughout the city of Tucson. Tucson Water has a great rebate program. So there are a lot of people in Tucson already using rainwater and, and integrating it into their household supply. And the green dots there, you see, are where their cistern size actually equals what is necessary in their area to be net zero urban water. So, so it is possible. There are um, some good things going on right now. Paradigm shift number three, siloed and collaborative. And you see this in a lot of industries, a move towards collaboration and really the importance of collaboration in big uh, problem solving. So uh, here are examples. There's 10 examples of net zero water buildings that currently exist in the United States and throughout the world. Uh, these projects exist, they're functioning, and they're doing well. Um, but in all these projects, a common, uh, a common thing in the design process is that they were all very collaborative teams and early on collaborative. And I think if you saw Ryan Meek's presentation yesterday about Meow Wolf, um, you'll appreciate this point um, as well. So two examples you can see on either side of me, on the right and the left, about where collaboration uh, was important and especially for the water system. 
So on the left over here, you see our beautiful College of Architecture, Plan uh, our College of Architecture Planning and Landscape Architecture, CAPLA, at the University of Arizona. This is our, our garden outside of our building. Uh, you can see that the building is the, that screen to uh, the left. An important part of this project is the integration between inside, what's happening inside the building, and what's happening outside the building. So as architects, we're used to receiving projects, and we draw, you know, kind of the building footprint and really deal with the building uh, without thinking that much about the landscape until further on. But for water systems and integrating these alternative water sources, it's really important to think about both early on and how one can benefit the other. And so in this project, uh, we have within the building a giant rainwater cistern that actually spans the whole height of the building from top to bottom. And we capture our rainwater, and then that rainwater is used, if you can see that pipe there, it goes into that that pond and creates this beautiful riparian space. People from around campus cite this as their favorite place on campus, and it's really because of the water. It's because of that rainwater collection that's happening in the building. So on the right, you see another example, the Bullet Center. This is in downtown Seattle, Washington. It's a seven-story Class A office building, and it is net zero water. Uh, and they worked with... Uh, a whole team of people very early on to succeed in this. They brought in code officials from day one. Uh, for example, the building has composting toilets on all seven stories, uh, and that was something that they really needed to work early on with the code officials. The green uh, landscaping that you see growing on the curb, that's all fed through gray water. And again, collaboration was, was really instrumental in getting this project uh, permitted and, and built. So the fourth paradigm shift, number four, technological innovation and social innovation. And this is really important because a lot of times we think these big challenges that we have in society, well, if we just have the technology, right? If we just get the right, the right, if we invent the right thing, it'll all go away, there will be some silver bullet. Well, I'm here to tell you, for decades, we have had the technology to be net zero urban water. We, we can be there. We have the technology to have net zero water buildings. But what's inhibiting us largely is this social innovation, right? So it's both public perception, willingness to adopt new technologies, um, and it's also regulation and how slowly things change over time. And so this is a big paradigm shift, getting these two things aligned. So let me walk you through a couple examples uh, of, of how this has been, um, you know, a real challenge uh, in net zero water. So what you see behind me is an example of one of the main systems uh, that enables a net zero water building. So this is rainwater to potable, and then uh, from the drinking water uh, to non-potable gray water uses. What you see that are bullseyes, these are basically hurdles that the architect has to figure out a solution to. So it's really time consuming. So it's a system innovation needed and or a license required and or appeal to state or local officials and or operation, operator license required, right? So water's really complicated, regulatory <laughs> speaking, because it's not just building code and plumbing code, it's public health code, and it's environmental regulation as well. And so there's a lot of conflicting uh, codes that exist and different vocabulary, and navigating this is very time consuming. So again, if you remember Ryan's presentation from yesterday, how he talked about, you know, we really want to spend, as architects, we really want to spend our energy on the, the design process and the visioning process. But in the end, we end up spending a lot of time here um, because of, um, because of the, the social innovation that's lagging behind. Um, and it costs clients a lot of money to pursue these systems for that reason as well. So the, I would consider the big change that's necessary in code. Right now, a lot of codes are prescriptive. That means that things are, um, it has to perform in an X a certain way. Uh, it has to look a certain way and act a certain way. But what code needs to change to, and this goes back to the adaptive capacity 
point as well, is uh, performance-based codes, where we're really telling architects, designers, how things need to perform, um, and we're leaving it to them to design the solution of how that happens. And a lot of this starts to go away if it's a performance-based code system. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through three systems that are necessary for net zero water buildings and tell you about some of the regulatory changes necessary for them. So this, I'm not gonna get into this, but this is a diagram of a net zero water building. And so basically, for all those 10 case studies that you saw, they all have these three systems. Drinking water, recycled water, and wastewater. So first, drinking water. So centralized system, this is a water treatment plant that we normally think about. In net zero water buildings, they're using either sustainable wells or capturing rainwater and using it for potable water. And so I'm gonna talk about on a commercial scale. Residential uh, rainwater to potable, uh, the homeowner can take on their own liability, but when we're talking about public water supplies, it's a very different thing. And so the regulatory changes that are, that are necessary, the innovations that are necessary are, for example, right now there's only one uh, building material that is certified to be able to be part of a drinking water system. So we need more materials and we need more certifications uh, for these kinds of uh, systems to exist. Also, uh, right now, in order to go drinking water to potable, it needs to uh, have, uh, be operated by a certified uh, operator. Um, and there's many different ways of, of addressing this. Um, and the Santa Monica City Services Building, they certainly found their way around it. And, and other projects as well. And so there needs to be new code avenues for, for these, to allow for these types of systems. So the second system, recycled water, this is a wastewater treatment plant. Um, you know, and to the other side, we can think about using gray water. We can actually think about you know, not sending it all the way to the wastewater treatment plant, but using it and infiltrating it locally and using it to grow things, right? And so some of the code barriers Currently, um, are there's different definitions of gray water across different states <laughs> in the United States. Um, there's also uh, innovations that are necessary to talk about different kinds of gray water. So for example, in California, they now have this thing called dark gray water, uh, which is really helpful to um, pull out, say, kitchen water that is exposed to different kinds of bacteria and the treatment necessary and the kinds of things that can be used for versus, say, shower water or laundry water. Okay, lastly, system three, wastewater. So this is a fun one. This is my students' favorite one to talk about, <laughs> wastewater. Fascinating. People don't think about what happens when you flush your toilet and where the water goes and how you deal with biosolids. Um, but over here, you see typical toilet. And on the right here, you see um, what a composting toilet can look like. They don't have to look like what you experience you know, when you go to your national park or your favorite trailhead. Those are very nice, but they can also really be um, odorless and um, you know, normal looking toilet kind of experiences. Like, like you saw in the Bullet Center, that, that building um, has that. So a couple of regulatory changes necessary to allow for those. Uh, one thing is that they don't require a connection to the sewer and all buildings uh, usually within a city, there's a stipulation that they need to connect to the sewer system. Well, if a building doesn't need to, um, there needs to be a way in order for a uh, mechanism in order for them not to have to pay those sewer fees in order not to connect to the sewer system. There's also some other opportunities that to be developed further. The biosolids and the leachate uh, from those composting toilets, either it needs to, there needs to be a way to pasteurize that on site and to use that within the site or um, another uh, outside company come to, you know, once a year collect those biosolids. So, I'm gonna conclude here. So four, those are the big four paradigm shifts necessary uh, to transition us to net zero urban water future here in the Southwest and elsewhere. Uh, and I wanna guide you through just some thoughts about how you can go out there and also be part of this future. So first, Paradigm shift one, average in extremes. Uh, you can all, we can all uh, advocate for design that uh, designs with nature, right? That takes 
that adaptive capacity into consideration. Next, centralized and decentralized. Gray water systems, uh, rainwater systems. These are things that we can integrate into our own household and into our own businesses. Thirdly, siloed and collaborative. We all depend on water, right? We're all living, we drink it every day, we need it, and we can all participate in our urban water systems and advocate for change. And then lastly, the technological innovation and the social innovation. Perhaps this is the most important um, in terms of being open to change, right? A lot of the social inhibition is because of public perception and kind of fear and um, blocks to some of the changes that are necessary. I think we need to live in the new reality that we live in a water-constrained uh, environment and that we need to do things a little differently and that's going to create changes in the built environment, that's going to create changes in the way that we interact and, and work with water. But to, to summarize, you know, to end on where we are, we're in the wonder house and I think wonder, curiosity, really can motivate us to be open to new futures and to be open to, uh, to change and to accepting uh, changes in our urban water system. So thank you all uh, for, for your attention and I look forward to taking any questions that you might have. Okay, yes. I have a question. That was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering when you think about the design of net wa zero water buildings, how you take the time dimension into account. So thinking a building might last 50, 75, 100 years. Obviously, the, you know, you're in a mega drought. You don't know the, necessarily the duration or change in severity of the drought over, a, over an extended time period. A lot of uncertainties about that. And then also, you know, what will happen with population growth and water demand. So how, how do you take account of Mm -hmm. Thinking not just about today, which is daunting enough, but mm -hmm. thinking about what that design might need to be in an uncertain future. Wonderful question. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's part of the adaptive capacity thing, like we were talking about. Those parameters are changing, both in the social dimension, like you're talking about population, but also this natural system dimension in terms of climate. Um, and so it's something that... Um, that I think it goes back to resilience. It goes back to not just having one water system. I think the great thing about net zero water systems is that you're bringing in multiple supplies. Um, so you have the gray water system where you're, you're getting that shower water, for example, every day on a consistent supply, but then you're also bringing in rainwater and storing it. Um, and you can also uh, think about connecting to district systems. Um, and so you can have resilience between, you know, apartment buildings, residential buildings, and then businesses and so forth. So I think, you know, thinking about it in terms of resilience um, and, and diversifying those water supplies is, is something that's really important. It is also really important to have good data. And this is something that's coming up a lot uh, with architects. We're using 100 year, years of um, climate data to design our, you know, our energy and water systems. And it's just not... Uh, it's just not correct. And so we have to think about either the last 10 years or projective data. So it's really important, yeah. A lot of us live in buildings that have already been built. Yes, <laughs> that's right, yes. What, what's the low-hanging fruit when it comes to retrofitting like uh, houses or um, commercial buildings? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. <clears throat> So one of the things uh, is fixtures. So you'll see, I don't know if you guys know this, but you know, population has gone up. And fortunately, our, ur our urban water demands have stayed pretty level. And that's because of toilets, <laughs> of innovations in toilets. We used to have six gallon flush toilets. Imagine six gallons every time you went to the... So now we have 1.6 gallon toilets, and that's made a big difference. So things like that, just upgrading fixtures, having aerators, you know, not... I mean, shorter showers are great, but we're, you know, we're humans. <laughs> and so, you know, even just uh, lower flow shower heads that have the same amount of pressure but use less water, um, though, that's low hanging fruit. And then there are gray water systems where you don't have to have dual plumbing. So, uh, for example, laundry, laundry water uh, to use in your, in your garden or something like that to use to irrigate. 
outside, I think is really important. And then the last thing I'll say is conservation. And this is a big, uh, this is a big message, I think, for, for California, Phoenix, Tucson, we're doing a really good job, but no, we could do better, um, in terms of landscaping. We think that grass should be everywhere. <laughs> it really shouldn't be. You know, there are native and appropriate plants, um, and there are ones that are just not. And outdoor landscaping can account for, you know, 40, even up to 60% of water demand. And so just to change that um, can, really, can really change things across our, our urban landscape. Yeah, so thank you. It's a good point. Hi, thank you so much. This was an incredible talk. Um, your points about centralizing and decentralizing are really mm -hmm. interesting. And when I think going to a de decentralized system, I just think of city. I just think of the impact of asking individuals to decentralize versus the city taking action mm -hmm. turn to that system. Where do you think the city's role is in that, if any, other than maybe changing codes? Yeah, that's a great, great question and something kind of yet to be seen. It's an open debate because I also think direct potable reuse, even though we don't like to talk about it, like toilet to tap. Um, but that's a, it's a big centralized solution that um, a lot of cities are going to. It's coming, you know, across the Southwest. Um, so that's, that's one thing. I think there are big centralized, there are better centralized solutions. But then in terms of the decentralized things, so I know Tucson Water has rebates for gray water and rainwater, so they can, they can support um, that innovation and that transition. Um, but also, I think there are technologies, I'm not talking about technologies that are like a few years off, but maybe decades into the future. One thing that would make a big difference in terms of that is in terms of um, water quality testing. So if there's in-pipe water quality um, innovations that are happening. So imagine a utility can, throughout a system, uh, monitor the water quality, rather than needing to you know, check it uh, from that centralized um, facility that's sending the water out and then you know, a few points throughout the city, imagine that they could do it in real time, um, then those decentralized or di district kind of scale solutions are, are much more feasible, right? Yeah. So, there. Thank you so much for that talk, that was wonderful. Um, I was just thinking when you're talking about rainwater that there's a brand of uh, bubbling and still drinking water that they sell called Richard's Rainwater that's displacing Topo Chico and they sell it for two to four dollars oh. a bottle in Austin. Okay. Um, so I was just thinking that rainwater has some kind of like cachet mm -hmm. um, and where I, I work in, in the Caribbean in Trinidad and, and their rainwater is seen as like superior to pipeborne water also because the pipeborne water doesn't come regularly but um, and it, they don't treat it. I mean, it's just like where I lived, they used a shower curtain, and that was it, like on the top of the tank just mm -hmm. to filter out gross material and then drink the rainwater. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if, like, if it's even ne necessary to treat it that much or? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. I also want to point out this is my brother, <laughs> Brent Crossan. He's a professor at UT Austin, <laughs> anthropologist. Um, yeah, so it is a really good question. Um, yeah, there's very little treatment necessary um, for rainwater. Uh, so it actually only requires a little bit of sand filtration and then uh, UV, like a UV light to get some of the bacteria. The EPA requires you to use chlorine as well. They require you to have an active agent, but I wouldn't say that's not necessary. And it's interesting, yeah, in this world of like worrying about PFAS and all this other stuff, rainwater is really the, is really the cleanest. Um, so you're right, there should be some cachet. Um, so maybe maybe there's some enterprises out there that'll that'll figure out how to bottle that and market it. But yeah, <laughs> that's great. Any other? Yeah. Um, I'm a botanist, so obviously I'm thinking about the plants. Yes. And if we're capturing all the rainwater, or like as much of the rainwater as we possibly mm -hmm. can in these arid, delicate systems, yeah. will there be enough? for the surrounding it ecosystem. It's a really good point, and I'm glad you brought it up, and it's one that comes up a lot, right? Because there's also, I don't know if you've heard, there, there is regulation in, in um, Colorado that doesn't allow you to capture rainwater, and Utah just changed, but at any rate, the important thing about the net zero water design is that it's a holistic water design, meaning that we infiltrate the water on site, right? 
So even if we're capturing rainwater, we're using it within the building, except for the drinking water we ingest, that water should eventually end up outside, um, infiltrated into the natural environment. Of course, in a safe way for plants and plants appropriate to that water. But um, yeah, that's, that's the answer. Great, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. Just one more question. So you talked about showers and not wanting to take short showers. <laughs> if, I, if I'm taking a shower, a long shower, yeah. water comes from a source, comes out the faucet, runs across me, goes out to the wastewater treatment plant. Mm -hmm. How much of the water that comes from the source makes it to the wastewater treatment plant and what are the factors? Are we talking 90% mm -hmm. makes it back, 95, 75, and how does it vary and why? Yeah, I think it's, I don't know first the exact number, so don't quote me on it, but my sense is, yeah, there are a lot, a lot of losses that occur along the way for different reasons. Leaks are one of the biggest losses, just, you know, we have these pipes underground and we can't see if they're leaking or not throughout the city, um, so I know that's like up to a 10% loss. Um, and then, you know, of course, the treatment procedures and so forth. So I'm guessing probably 80% or something like that. Um, yeah, showers. My point about showers is when you think about the big game of water. So, for example, in Arizona, cities actually only make up about 20% of our water use. Does anyone know what the big water user is? Agriculture, Agriculture yes, 70%. So, you know, shorter showers are important, do make us feel better. Um, you know, I think definitely lower flow fixtures that, you know, have the same pressure are important, but really, um, there's some, some sort of bigger practices, I think, that we really need to think about. And, you know, the you know, way we uh, you know, landscape is another example of one that's really important. So sh showers are important. I don't want to minimize it. I just think that in the scale of hierarchy of, of things, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. You wanted to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you, everyone.